Well, good morning, church family. We have had the opportunity to sing together. We've had the opportunity to worship through giving. We're going to continue worshiping by reading God's word together. And so if you have a copy of the scriptures, if you do not and you're here in this room, we have those in the back at the resource table. If you're joining us online, you may want to follow along with us on a Bible reading app. Uh, I prefer the U version Bible reading app. You may want to grab a copy of scriptures at home. But we want you to read this with us so that the other six days of the week, When we're not gathered, you can go back and see this true story from God's Word. And as you're turning to the book of Ruth, let me again say how grateful we are for the mothers that are here, and we celebrate you and those in our community uh, that may be celebrating this day. But I know for some of us, um, especially the women in the room, you may be investing in the next generation in a different way than biologically, investing the gospel in the next generation as a mentor, as a leader. So whatever that looks like in your life, We are grateful. We honor you, we respect you, and we're so privileged uh, to worship with you this morning. Um, Let me do this. Let me remind everybody where we are in the book of Ruth before we dig in. Ruth is the daughter-in-law of a woman named Naomi, and Ruth is coming back to Bethlehem, God's promised land, with her mother-in-law after the loss of Ruth's husband, Naomi's son, and after Naomi had lost her own husband. And so they are coming back to Bethlehem, coming back from a land called Moab. And as they return back, it is the barley harvest. It is a time where God's people are preparing to harvest the food that has been prepared for them. And we're going to read the entire chapter. This is a rare opportunity for us to do that. There's four chapters in the book of Ruth, four weeks in the sermon series. And normally I would put the scripture on the screen, but I want want you to read it this week for yourself. But it may be helpful for you to relax to not be distracted by the lyrics or the words being on the screen, and just to listen to this beautiful, true story as I read it. So however you need to process the scripture in this moment, let me invite you to do that as I read from Ruth chapter 2. Now, Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, and he was a prominent man of noble character from a Limelech's family, and his name was Boaz. Ruth the Moabitess asked her mother-in-law Naomi, Will you let me go into the fields and gather the fallen grain behind someone with whom I might find favor? And Naomi answered her, Go ahead, daughter. So Ruth left and entered the field to gather grain behind the harvesters. Now she just so happened to be in the portion of a field belonging to a man named Boaz, who was also from a Limelech's family. Now later, when Boaz arrived from Bethlehem, he said to his harvesters, The Lord be with you. And they replied, The Lord bless you also. Now Boaz asked his servants, who was in charge of the harvesters, Who is this young woman who has now appeared in the field? And the servant answered, Well, she's the young Moabite, the foreign woman who's returned here to Bethlehem with her mother-in-law Naomi. She asked us, She asked us, will you let me gather the fallen grain and the bundles behind your harvesters? And she came and she's been here on her feet ever since early morning, except that she did rest a little bit in the shelter. Then Boaz approached Ruth and he said to her, listen, my daughter, don't go and gather grain in any other field and don't you leave this one, but stay here close to my female servants. See which field they're harvesting in and join them. Haven't I ordered the young men in this field not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go and drink from the jars that these men have filled. And in verse 10, Ruth fell face down and she bowed to the ground and she said to Boaz, Why have I found favor with you so that you notice me? I'm a foreigner. I'm an outsider. And Boaz answered her, Everything you've done for your mother-in-law Naomi since your husband's death has been fully reported to me. It's been fully reported to me how you left your father and your mother in your native land of Moab and how you've come to a people that you didn't previously know. May the Lord reward you for what you've done and may you receive a full reward reward from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. In verse 13, my Lord, she said, I have found favor with you for you have comforted and encouraged your servant. Although I'm not like one of your female servants, I'm an outsider. And at mealtime, Boaz went a step further and said to her, Come over here and have a seat at my table and dip the bread in the vinegar sauce 
And so she sat beside the harvester and harvesters, and Boaz offered her roasted grain, and she ate and was satisfied and content, and she even had leftovers. And when she got up to gather grain, Boaz ordered his young men, let her gather grain from the bundles, and do not humiliate her, but pull out some stalks from the bundles and leave it for her to gather. Don't rebuke her. So Ruth gathered grain in the field until evening, and she beat out of the bundles what she had gathered, and it was about 26 quarts of barley that she gathered. And she picked up the grain, and she went into the town where her mother-in-law was, and she showed her what she had gleaned from the field. And she brought out the leftovers from the meal at Boaz's table and gave it to her mother-in-law. And her mother-in-law said in verse 19, Where did you gather barley today? My goodness, where did you work? May the Lord bless the man who noticed you in this way. And Ruth told her mother-in-law, whom she had worked with, The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May the Lord bless Boaz because he has not abandoned his kindness to the living or to the dead. Naomi said, this man is a close relative of my husband who's deceased. He's one of our family redeemers. So Ruth the Moabitess, the outsider, the foreigner, Ruth the Moabitess said this, he told me to stay with the young men until they have finished all of the harvest. So Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, my daughter, it's good for you to work with his female servants so that nothing will happen to you in another field. And Ruth stayed close to Boaz's female servants, and she gathered grain until the barley and the wheat harvest were finished, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Let's pray together. God, it is in this moment where we are mindful of how you are faithful to your people. For those of us in the room who did not grow up in the Jewish culture, for those of us who did not grow up with an agrarian background, many of the details of this story are going to be lost on us. But what cannot be lost in this story is your faithfulness to the foreigner and the outsider, the person who is vulnerable and at the mercy of others. You provide an advocate, someone to protect, someone to defend, someone to care for them. And Lord, we know the greatest ex example of this is you sending your son for us to love us extravagantly, generously, to care for us. And so God, as we read this story of Boaz's faithfulness to Ruth, this is really a story more about your faithfulness to your people. And Boaz points us towards Jesus, who has loved us so extravagantly that our lives are forever changed because of it. Lord, I pray that we would live in similar fashion because we're your people because there is no God like you, and we're called to live in the same manner. And we pray this in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. Amen. Well, I mentioned just a moment ago that if we do not grow up in an agrarian society or as farmers working a field, we may miss, and it may be lost on us, what's happening here in this text. But as I shared, Naomi, the mother-in-law of Ruth, and Ruth are returning from Moab, Naomi is an Israelite, but Ruth is an outsider. She's a Moabite, is coming back with her mother-in-law. They're both widows. They're coming back to Bethlehem at the time of the barley harvest. Now, barley and the barley harvest is a huge backdrop to this entire book. We're going to see it really strongly next week, and you can definitely read ahead to chapter 3 between now and next Sunday. But it was a time of celebration. Like they would have celebrated that like barley is planted in October and it usually doesn't come to fruition until April or May. Sometimes in our lives we, we have to plant seeds that God then waters and, and they come up months later and we wait and we anguish and we, we pray and we hope. And it would have been a time of celebration when they're returning. But it was also a, a perilous time specifically for Naomi and Ruth. Now, I mentioned just a moment ago, they had both lost their husbands. They are coming back into, for Ruth most definitely, they're coming back into a foreign land where there's no husband. And in this culture, the husband, the male, would be the provider, the protector, the advocate. It goes without saying that Ruth and Naomi would have been incredibly vulnerable. They would have been at the mercy of anyone who could help them. And most likely, Naomi, at her age as the mother-in-law, couldn't work in the field. And even if she had tried, people might have pushed her to the edges and not allowed her to be out there working among the younger servants. 
So as we read here in the text, with no choice, uh, they need to survive. They need sustenance. They need provision. Ruth asked her mother as a way of honoring the generation that's come before. Is it okay if I go out into the field? Will you let me go into the fields in verse 2? And Naomi answered, go ahead, daughter. And so Ruth left and entered the field to gather grain. This was a moment of tremendous faith. Now listen, I... I'm going to acknowledge, as I say oftentimes, it's a beautiful world, but it is a broken world. The reason there are viruses, we've all lived through that. We're still dealing with those side effects. The reason there are viruses, the reason there's sickness, the reason there's wrongdoing, the reason that there's evil and people mistreat others is because it's a beautiful world, but it's a broken world that bears the weight of the curse of sin from the Garden of Eden. And we're all born with a sin nature. And Even our earth is groaning for redemption. And even among God's people, this is Bethlehem. This is the promised land where God had led his people. It was a vulnerable moment for Ruth as she heads out into the field because the Bible tells us this was during the time of Judges. If you read your Bible, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, and what are we told over and over and over again from the book of Judges? That Israel had no king, and it was a time where everyone did what was right in their own eyes. What they wanted, what they thought, what they felt was right for their own desires, oftentimes selfish and at the expense of others. I hate to say this, and it has burdened me as a pastor all week long, that even among God's people, a vulnerable woman without a husband would have to fear for her safety and what other men would want to do to her while she gathered out in a field. But she steps out in faith because they have no choice. Now, I want you to think about being vulnerable and at the mercy of others. Have you ever needed somebody just to put a good word in for you? Hey, I'm out here grinding. I'm out here doing the best I can. I mean, we talk about that with our boys and our daughter at home. Like, look, you can't control how other people act. You can't control the circumstances of the world. But you can take care of you. And you can take steps each day to be proactive and assertive. I mean, like, have you ever been in a position where you're doing everything you can, but you just need, you don't need a handout, but you need a hand up. You need somebody that will step in and use their power and their influence to bless and to protect and to encourage. I mean, if you've ever felt that way, that's that's Ruth's story here. She is a, I need to emphasize it, she's an outsider, she's a foreigner, she's an alien, she's a stranger, and she could be taken advantage of. Several years ago, I had the privilege of meeting several of the lost boys from Sudan. I don't know if you're familiar with their story, but when civil war broke out some two decades ago, many of these young boys who were 13 and 14 were driven out into the wilderness as their parents' lives were were taken from them. They raised their siblings and they raised infant brothers and sisters. And so many of these lost boys were relocated by the United States to cities throughout the Southeast as an opportunity to, to maybe protect and take care of them. And as I got to know some of their stories, the beautiful stories and understand their culture, uh, Nashville was one of the cities where they were relocated to, Jacksonville, Florida, Nashville, other places. And as I got to know their story over meals, how important is it to break bread with people, not just talk and passing They would share with me the struggle they had showing up in America, not being able to speak, not being able to understand. They were given financial resources by the government, but they didn't even know how to spend it. They didn't know how much things cost. And they even shared with me how they had extended family members that were robbed or abused or even murdered by people who wanted to take advantage of them because they were misplaced or they were outsiders in a a culture they didn't understand. It still happens today. Now, this is Ruth's story from several thousand years ago, but there are outsiders among us. And yes, sometimes that may be someone with a different pigmentation of skin than us, like me getting to know those lost boys. It it may mean somebody from a different ethnic group. Ruth is a Moabite, and she is coming into an Israelite area. So it may be an outsider that ethnically is different than you. But I just want to go ahead and acknowledge that it may be someone who looks just like you, someone who lives in the same apartment community as you that feels like an outsider, that feels vulnerable and at the mercy of others. If we open our eyes and the Lord would allow us to get out of ourselves and to think others first, I mean, isn't that the way of Christ, to think less of ourselves and be more focused on others? Maybe even to get to know their story, we would realize how many people are vulnerable among us. So I want you to take inventory right now at this moment. The people in the places you live, work, and play who are at the mercy of others, anyone that would stand in for them. That's Ruth's story in this moment. So she steps out in faith and she steps into a field. And I don't know if you saw this in verse 3. It says she just so happened to step into a portion of the field belonging to Boaz. I studied this text with some other pastors this week and we all kind of chuckle because it just so happens. It may sound like coincidence, but God directed her to 
into the right field. Now, I'm not saying that everything will be wonderful and everything will be awesome if you give your life to following God through faith in Jesus Christ, but sometimes all he asks is you just take the next step. You, you just take the next step, and I will be faithful to you. And she steps into this field that belongs to a man named Boaz. Now, remember, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, her husband, through his family tree, Boaz, is one of the descendants. He is one of our redeemers. He's in our family tree. He, he by the nature of who God is and his character and being God's people, is supposed to look out for those who may be part of our own family. So she steps into this field, and now listen, remember, this is a strange woman, an outsider that's incredibly vulnerable, who steps into the field, and in verse 5, he says, hey guys, hey, who is this strange woman that's wandering through our field? And they respond to her. What did they respond to him? What did they say? She's the young Moabite woman who returned with Naomi. And, and Boaz's response is not like the men of the culture. I'm not saying they were all bad. But there was enough that a woman had to be very careful. But his response seems counter to how many of the men might have been behaving, right? It seems counter to the way that many individuals might have received her or engaged her. But Boaz does something incredibly different. Look at what it says in verse 8. Boaz told Ruth, don't go to another field. But you stay here and stay close to my female servants. There's strength in numbers. Don't leave my field. In other words, I'm going to do something for you that you will be brought in and you will not be treated like an outsider. But stay close to the female servants. Verse 9, if you get thirsty, these men that are around here, they have already drawn water. Have you a sip of water. You don't have to work for that. Just simply ask for it and they'll provide it. Verse 14, at mealtime, why don't you sit here at my table? It doesn't matter if you feel like an outsider. It's my table. So if I invite you, you're welcome to sit at my table. I want you to feel relaxed, and I want you to eat so much that you feel satisfied. Isn't that what Scripture said? I want you to feel so content, and I want you to take the leftovers to your mother-in-law. I want you to share this with your extended family. And Boaz ordered the men what? He, I want the men in the room. I want the men that are part of our congregation watching online to pay close attention. What? He, he's, being, he's using his power and authority not to take advantage of someone, but he's using his power and his authority and his influence to be an advocate, to bless, to protect. Like it's, I mean, it's not just generosity. It's borderline like extravagant. Not only does he say you can have food, you can, like, I'm going I'm to take care of you, I'm going to serve you, I'm going to comfort you, I'm going to encourage you. That's what she says, right? Like, oh, my goodness, you have comforted and encouraged your servant. But he goes over and above, and it's almost as if he views like her being in his field as a responsibility to steward his relationship and his friendship with her. Now, I want to say something to the men in the room because this is what godly biblical leadership looks like in a dating relationship, in marriage, in working with our daughters, in working with the next generation, really in working with anybody, but think about in male-female relationships. He goes over and above and he says, don't humiliate her, don't you make her the butt of a joke, don't you rebuke her, and don't you touch her. I don't care what people do in other fields. Surely he cared. I'm simply illustrating, I'm not responsible for those fields. This is my field, and you won't touch her. Because if you do that, it's going to violate her dignity. It's going to unintentionally communicate her lack of self-worth. And I will not have you do that in my field. Not only will I not have you do that, I want to make sure she understands. She may be an outsider, and she may be a foreigner, and she may feel that way. But we're not going to treat her that way. And we're going to be for her and be an advocate for her. He responds so extravagantly. Like, what makes Boaz so different? Like, where are you at, Boaz, in our churches and in our communities? This is, like, incredible. What makes him so different than the other men? And you know, something that's interesting, we're reading here in Ruth. I don't know when the last time you read in Ruth was. It's okay if you're like, I've never read in Ruth. Matter of fact, sometimes it's easier to read the New Testament if you didn't grow up with a Jewish background. I have a good friend who is Jewish and, and, and teaches me what he learned in Jewish school when he was young. Like, and and it's, it's fascinating. But if you didn't grow up with that background, right, it's just like, oh, sometimes it's hard to read. And if you didn't, let me, let me tell you, like sometimes you start, did anybody start a Bible reading plan this year? Anybody say, I'm going to read the Bible through? Okay, if, if, 
if your Bible reading plan, your best intentions, got shipwrecked on the shores of Deuteronomy and Leviticus, take heart, okay? It happens to the best of us, right? And, and, and let me tell you, hang with me here for just a minute. Why would Boaz behave differently? What is it about him that's different? Well, listen, you, you remember when God's people, hundreds of years before this, you remember when God's people were enslaved in Egypt? Do you remember that? You remember the Exodus, right? Moses holds up his staff, the sea parts, they walk through on dry land. Then once they're out, once they're saved, and the waves come crashing in on the Egyptians, they, they're about to wander into the promised land. And God had told them, you're my people. He promised Abraham, you're my people. I'm entering into a relationship with you, and I'll never leave you or forsake you, and I will bless you so that you can bless others. And God's still going to be faithful to his people. And when they leave the Exodus, when they leave Egypt, God is keenly aware for 400 years. You think you've had a bad few days or a bad few weeks? Four centuries, they're enslaved by Egyptians. They're Hebrews, outsiders, in an Egyptian land. And God's very aware for 400 years. They have watched, observed, and unfortunately absorbed some of those mindsets and behaviors. They saw how the Egyptians mistreated them. They saw how the Egyptians took advantage of outsiders that wandered in other than the Hebrews. And God wants to make sure, listen, I've led you out of slavery. Before I lead you into the promised land, I want you to understand when we get there, there's going to be outsiders. There's going to be foreigners. And you need to know how to live. And, and you need to know how to treat people differently than what you've observed. Over and over and over again in the Old Testament, God says, be holy because I'm holy. There ain't nobody in this church and nobody in this community, nobody on this planet that is like God and that he is holy, he is other than, he's perfect. And I absolutely love that about him. He says, be other than. Come apart with me from the, from the way the world behaves and treats people because there's no God like me, Yahweh. And there should be no people like you in the way you treat and behave, out, and behave around outsiders. So when you read the book of Leviticus, he tells them, like, these are the laws, and these are the rituals, and these are the cleansing. This is the way you stay in a right relationship with me. But one of the things that he says, it is one of my favorite verses in Leviticus. How many times do you get to say that phrase, right? Leviticus 23, 22. When you harvest the crops in your land. Now, if you're just reading through mundanely, you miss this. When you harvest the crops in your land, do not harvest the grain along the edges of your field. Do not pick up what the harvesters drop, but you leave it <clears throat> for the poor and the foreigners that live among you, because I am the Lord your God. Now, in the moment, it might not have made a whole lot of sense. Like that, um, what? Like the only farming we've ever seen is you maximize the entire property, right? You squeeze every bit of provision, and if you're going to sell that grain at the market, like you use the whole thing. But the Jews would literally... Farm there, if you had a square plot, an acre, if you will, they would farm it in the shape of a diamond. And they would only harvest what was in the middle and they would leave the edges. Now, I bet other countries, when they behaved and started doing that, were like, you guys are crazy. You're wasting. You're leaving. Like, it doesn't make sense. And here's what I've learned. Not because some spiritual giant, but just through the Lord teaching me, it doesn't matter if I understand everything about what God is doing because I'm not God. All he asks of us is to obey him. It doesn't matter what anybody thinks. It doesn't matter what another nation thinks. And we're having this conversation with our kids in our home. It doesn't matter what other people think. It doesn't matter what you think they think. It only matters what God thinks. And through your relationship with Jesus, he reveals that to you and through the scripture. So that in Leviticus is happening hundreds of years before there was ever a Boaz. Hundreds of years before there's ever a Ruth who's vulnerable and in need of somebody, not to take advantage of her, but somebody to protect her. And the reason, one of the reasons that there's grain in the field for her to eat is because Boaz was faithfully obedient to what God told him to do with his resources. Listen, it may be Ruth, the book of Ruth. God's name is Yahweh. There is no God like this God. If you were going to make up a God, would you make up a God who would say, I am all-powerful, and I choose to share with others what I have at my disposal? No, you wouldn't make that up. God says, I choose to share with outsiders that are outside of my chosen people. I choose to share with them. 
But that's so like the character and the nature of God, isn't it? Nobody's loved us like that. And isn't that what he did in sending Jesus Christ for us? How are any of us that are in relationship with God in that relationship? I didn't grow up Jewish. I didn't grow up as a Hebrew or an Israelite, but he's offered me, like Ruth, he's offered those of us that are in relationship with him a chance to be grafted into the family tree of faith because he sent Jesus Christ to be our Redeemer. When I think about Boaz, I think what a godly example of obedience and God's faithfulness hundreds of years before Ruth showed up to provide for her. But I think of Jesus. I think of Boaz being the Christ figure. He makes me think of Jesus. The Philippians chapter 2 says, being very nature with God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he humbled himself. He took on the nature of a servant. He laid down his life for us on the cross. Jesus had all the power and all the authority and all the influence that anyone could ever be given. He is God. He never lost any of his divinity in becoming human. But he says, I choose to lay down my life and think of others more than myself. And the only way we can think that way, the only way we can behave that way is because Christ is working in and through us. He has been the greatest advocate, the greatest defender. God says, I'm not like other gods and you're not like other people. I'm generous, so you be generous. I care about widows and orphans and the poor and the foreigners among you, so you, church, care about the poor and the widows and the orphans and the vulnerable among you. That's our call as a church. And we do that, yes, so that people can see how much God loves them. The gospel of Jesus Christ is what drives us to do that. It's not just to do good. Because we want people to know Jesus. But whether or not they respond is not what we're called to do. Our response or our obedience is to faithfully love and serve and bless. That's why we mentor in the local elementary school for children who do not have someone to read to them. That's why we serve at Siloam Health Center working with foreigners and outsiders who have been relocated in Nashville. That's why we show up. That's why we're advocates for those who don't have any power or authority in their own lives. I heard a story this past year of a Pakistani family who came to Nashville. A Pakistani family came here with nothing. They couldn't speak English, no resources. They go to Siloam Health Center right down here to, to get connected because their son ran a fever. Their son ran a fever, and they didn't know what to do, and they didn't know how to read the road signs, or even if they got a hold of a medicine bottle, they wouldn't know what to administer, and so they called 911. The ambulance shows up, and the paramedics get there, and they realize pretty quickly, like, it's it's a high fever, but but he's going to be okay. And within 48 hours, it was gone, he was fine. A couple weeks later, the family receives a bill for almost $3,000 from the hospital. They're foreigners, they're strangers, they can't speak English, they don't have financial resources, and now they're in debt. How many of us have gotten into a hole of debt, and we couldn't get out of it. And we're like, how did this, I can't even, I'm trying hard, and I can't get ahead. And so praise God, Siloam Health Center has a ministry called Nashville Neighbors, where Christians who love God and say, there's nobody like our God, and he's preparing the church right now to step in and help people that aren't even here yet. And some of our members, at one point last year, 25 of our members were part of the Nashville Neighbors program, where you would go with a translator into the home and say, we want to help. We'll go to the grocery store with you, help you learn how to read labels, help you learn how to navigate Uber and and other things so you won't be taken advantage of. We'll ride with you. We'll sit with you when you go to your doctor's appointment. We're not here to pity you. That's not what we do. We're here to be an advocate for you in the way that Boaz was for Ruth, in the way that Jesus has been for us, the hands and feet of Jesus. What a beautiful representation of the heart and the character of God. That's all right here in the book of Ruth. It's a story of Ruth, but it's a story even more so of God's faithfulness. I think one of the biggest questions I would ask everybody in this room, and you may say, like, I don't, he most likely had some financial resources because he owned property, he had a field. So maybe you have finances, maybe your bank account is robust. If it's not, hang with me here, because if you live in North America, you are in the richest 5 to 7% of the planet, is what it is. What are you doing with your field? What are you doing with your resources? For one person, it may be financial. And and the Lord speaks to you and says, you need to help fund the advancement of ministry through X, Y, or Z. It may be, I'm not called to that or I can't do that. But what I can do is I can give my time. I think time is just as precious a commodity as financial resources in some scenarios. You can't spend it two ways. Once you spend 60 minutes somewhere, that's it. You can't go back and get it. 
maybe it's to get involved with Siloam Health Center. Maybe it's to come forward and say, what do I need to do to, to get plugged into helping the foreigner and the stranger? But remember what I said. It could be somebody who looks just like you, lives in your townhome, lives in your apartment community, lives in your dormitory, lives in your neighborhood, works in your office, sits in the same cube farm as you, and because we're not thinking of others first and with the heart and the character of God, we just totally miss an opportunity to bless and serve others because God has loved us extravagantly that way. Absolutely love this story of God's faithfulness. Man, there's nobody like our God. Nobody looks out for people like that. No God calls his followers to look out for people like that. And we are not perfect. God, forgive us. We repent when we don't live how we should, right? There were men who were God's people, weren't living in the fields like they're supposed to. We repent of that and we say, if we mess up, God, forgive us, but we're going to keep trying because you've called us to be faithful. And that's what we're called to do. That's what we're called to do. So let me encourage you to bow your head and close your eyes for just a moment here.